morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for being here um, and this ICANN symposium. Um, and so um, this symposium is all about the International Children's Acceleratory Database. And what we really wanted to do is to share with you the work we've been doing on ICAD and have discussions about the opportunities that ICAD offers also for studying um, maybe natural experiments or determinants of physical activity and sedentary behaviour. So that's why we organised this symposium here. We're very pleased that we have um, four eminent speakers um, talking about um, both what ICAD actually is and showing some examples of the work we've been doing um, with ICAD. Um, my name is Esther von Slaus. Um, I work at the MLC Epidemiology Unit in the Centre for Diet and Activity Research in Cambridge um, and I'm involved in ICAD as part of the steering committee. Um, and I'll give a brief introduction um, for this symposium. Yes. Um, so ICAD was particularly initiated by Professor Chris Ridder, oh, that wasn't, that's it, um, who's here on uh, your left-hand side. Um, and in probably about 2005, 2006, he started networking at um, events like this to discuss his ideas about actually the opportunities that um, come with lots of studies using the same type of accelerometer to measure children's physical activity. Um, he then got a group of um, three other eminent researchers together, um, Ulf Eklund, Ken Judge and um, Ashley Cooper, and they submitted a grant application to the National Prevention Research Initiative in 2007, uh, which got funded. Um, they then started to work contacting um, studies across the world to contribute their data, and in 2010, the first version of the ICAD database um, was released for uh, data requests. So this is taken from the original grant application um, for ICAD. So these were the original objectives for the ICAD project. So it talks about pooling physical activity data and working towards developing a large, diverse and contextually rich database. Um, it talks about using the high level of statistical power it would create by pooling all of this data and reducing the error we have um, due to diverse processing methods. And also, it talks about capitalising on the cultural diversity of the data. And so I hope with the examples we're providing here today, you can, you can see how we've tried to um, follow that trajectory. ICAD to date has given rise to a number of publications, um, high-impact high publications. And if you want to see more, we, we have a dedicated website for ICAD um, on, our, uh, on our unit website. And there you will have links to uh, most of these open access uh, papers. So for this symposium, we have three aims. We want to, to introduce ICAT to you. What's the rationale and what does the database actually look like? And also to, to, share, to share some of our um, uh, future plans. We want to present results of um, ongoing um, ICAT analyses that um, illustrate the potential strength of this database. And then we want to make sure there's plenty of time to discuss opportunities um, and challenges and potential future directions for the database. And we're very open to your suggestions of how we can make the database more useful and more accessible to you. So as I said, there are four eminent speakers. First, Lauren Sherrard, who did the bulk of the work of actually um, creating um, the first ICAT database. Um, she will be um, providing an introduction um, to, the, to ICAT. And then there are three speakers who will talk about ongoing analyses. Um, first, Jonathan Mitchell will talk about uh, an etiological analysis, very much capitalising on the um, statistical power um, of ICAT. Um, Anna Tiperio will be talking about another etiological um, study, but she will actually be combining the accelerometer data with some of the self-report um, data on um, activity and sedentary behaviours that are available in ICAD. And then Anna Goodman will be talking about a natural experimental study she conducted using the ICAD database. And we're very uh, pleased that we have um, Stuart Biddle with us today to lead our discussion afterwards. Um, the structure for the symposium will be that each speaker has around 10 minutes um, to um, give their presentation and then we'll have one or two factual um, uh, questions in order to leave plenty of time for the discussion um, afterwards. So first I'd like to welcome Lauren uh, to the stage to give the introduction to ICAD. Well, 
thank you very much for coming here today. I know it's the last day of the, of the conference. Um, I'm very excited to be here to introduce ICAD, which I do think is a, is a very useful resource that, that we've been developing. So, as I'm sure you're all well aware, um, accelerometry has really gained popularity over the last 15 years, and one of the de facto standards for kind of collecting data has been using the ACTGRAPH um, monitor. So what we've had is a number of studies around the globe that have collected data using the ACTGRAPH accelerometer to be objective measurement of physical activity or sedentary behaviour. But in addition to this, we've had quite a similar um, predictors or health outcome data that's also been collected. So this could be information on socioeconomic status or health outcomes such as cardiometabolic risk. So this really offers quite an exciting potential where we could either compare and contrast data from many different cultures and international populations, but also we could pull the data to create a really large sample size where we have a lot of power, but also it's very heterogeneous um, in terms of diversity of the populations. So we really get a good representation of the data set. The trouble is, at the moment, we really are hindered by the fact that the data, the accelerometer data, has been reduced in so many different ways. So this could be the cut points used for the intensities, it could be the algorithms used to removal of non-wear, or the criteria for a valid day. So what this means is that we really, at this moment, can't compare data across different data sets where it's been collected. So the actual aim of ICAD is actually quite simple. It's to pull um, accelerometer data in children from across the world that's used the ACTGRAPH accelerometer. And then to, we're pulling the raw DAT files and then to um, reduce them using standardized techniques. And at the same time, we would pull the phenotypic or the accompanying data also. So as Esther alluded to, the original pooling occurred between September and May 2010. Data was collected between 3 and 18 year olds. At that time, there wasn't many much data collected on children younger than 3 years of age. We ended up pooling just over 46,000 raw actograph.dat files, and these ranged from these three versions of the actograph monitor. We also pulled as much accompanying data that crossed over at least three studies. So often, this was information such as maternal education, height, weight, BMI. We ended up with 21 studies. Um, which differed, they were from cross-sectional longitudinal and close co cohort design. We also had data from four interventions. So of the 21 studies that were pulled, um, they were highly focused in Europe. In Europe. So 13 of the studies uh, were located in Europe, and you can see that by the, the um, pins on this map here. We were lucky enough to be able to pull one data from Brazil, and this was a cross-sectional sample from the Pelotas 1993 birth cohort. There were two studies, both based in Melbourne, um, in Australia, so there was the Clan study and HEAPS. And there was a number of studies from the United States. Um, we were able to um, reproduce two waves of the data from the NHANES nationally representative data from the US, so that's actually represented by the red, red pins on the map. And there was also Project TAG, which actually recruited from a number of states in the United States. So all of the raw.dat files were reduced using standardized techniques. So this included um, reintegrating a lot of the files, so we reintegrated them all up to 60 second epochs. We used the same non-wear definition across all data files, the minimum wear day threshold, and we um, ran a number of intensity thresholds. So we actually gave the users by the choice on the number of, um, of intensity thresholds that they could use. We also made sure that we treated the data consistently when they crossed over daylight saving time zones. So what enabled us to actually do this was we had to run an awful, or I had to run an awful lot of files, about 46,000, so we had um, quite a powerful data reduction tool, um, tool which is called Kinesoft, and it was custom made. Um, to reduce um, accelerometer data files. So this just shows you a screenshot of the, of the software program. So of the just over 46,000 DAT files that were pulled, we ended up with a viable sample of about 44,500 data files. Um, files were removed if they were spurious or corrupt, so which meant they couldn't run through the data set. Also, if they didn't have the bare minimum of phenotypic data, which was actually age, gender, height, and weight. So these standardized outcome variables which were produced through the running of the ICAD data actually enables us 
probably for the first time, to be able to look across different cultures and different here, international samples, and actually compare outcome variables such as minutes spent to moderate to vigorous physical activity. So here just shows um, children that were 9 to 10 years of age. The blue bar shows males and the red bar um, shows females. And as you can see, you can just see the prevalence of meeting physical activity guidelines here. So obviously, the um, standardised reduction of the accelerometer data files was only part of the, the work that needs to be done. The other bulk of the work was actually the harmonisation of the phenotypic data. So where data was collected in a similar manner across at least three studies, the data was pulled and we did a, an attempt to harmonise across these. So this just shows you one example of the raw maternal education categories that were pulled across a number of these studies and how we then recoded in them into a standardised outcome for ICAD, which is shown in the far column there. So if you are interested, the um, methods of the standardization of the .dat files and the harmonization is provided in a methods paper which was published in 2011 in BMC Public Health. As uh, Esther suggested, all the um, data sharing and data use um, documents are uploaded onto the MRC um, website. And if you actually go into Google and you put ICAD MRC, it should be the top hit. So what is the activity in the ICAD data to date? We have actually at present 24 external applications to use the ICAD and they've all been approved. However, there are a host of other research questions that can be addressed using the existing data set. The resource has been used for a number of peer review publications. Um, it's been used in masters and PhD theses and in conference abstracts, which you're going to see here today. Um, as well as being um, in peer review publications, the um, iPad data was also featured in the physical activity, the last physical activity series, which was quite a, a milestone for our data set. So if we're talking about the future directions of ICAD, we are in the presence of 2.0 of ICAD, um, where we're actually looking to pull new data um, to the resource. So 33 studies from 15 countries have been identified as potential contributors to this next wave of ICAD um, data pooling. We're also looking with uh, the more kind of wisdom and with Esther's contribution to potentially um, look at harmonizing further phenotypic data that was actually collected for those original ICAD studies. And some of the studies that were originally pulled have actually collected new waves of data collection. So we're actually looking to pull those because obviously there's a lot of merit in, in longitudinal data. And lastly, we do really want to prioritise underrepresentative um, samples that aren't currently in ICAD. So these include preschoolers and even the older adolescent age range, but also very importantly, other countries that really aren't represented. As I said before, we're very much centred around Australia, United States and Europe. And it'd be really nice if we could get Africa, Asia, South America and other countries not yet represented. So I'd like to acknowledge the original funding bodies, but in particular um, our partners who contributed data to ICAD. Without them, we wouldn't have a data set. Thank you. Um, so I suggest we take questions from Laura and later on, because that will be part of the bigger um, discussion around the ICAD database. Um, and so we now move on um, to Jonathan Mitchell, who will be um, sharing with us, with us his uh, work on uh, quantile regression analysis. Okay, well, uh, thanks everyone for being here, and um, I'd like to thank Esther and uh, Lauren for uh, organising this symposium. Um, and I'm going to be presenting some results from an ICAD study I've been doing with my colleagues from the University of South Carolina, Marcia Dowdell and uh, Ross Pate. And uh, the title of my talk is uh, Phys Activity, Sense Behavior, and Childhood Obesity at Quantile Regression Analysis. Uh, so, why were we motivated to study childhood obesity? Um, I'm sure everyone in the room knows that uh, childhood obesity is a major public health problem. Uh, in the US, 16% of children um, are classified as obese. And um, if you look over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, the prevalence of class 2 and class 3 uh, childhood obesity is actually increasing. Um, so this is a major public health problem, and um, furthermore, obesity tracks from childhood uh, into adulthood, and um, obesity-related uh, metabolic uh, comorbidities are increasingly being diagnosed um, in children. Um, so this just undermines that this is a, a major problem, and uh, childhood obesity is a, a key period, I think, where we can um, 
uh, to target to, to reduce the problems of obesity across the lifespan. Uh, so during the time uh, period that uh, obesity has been increasing uh, from around 1960 to the present day, uh, there have been secular declines in moderate to vigorous physical activity and secular increases in uh, central behaviour. And there are, have been association studies that have linked um, these behaviours to obesity, um, but we think there's a gap in the science um, here and we, we don't fully understand how um, and if um, MEP and central behaviour do independently contribute to childhood obesity. Um, so you can see here I've listed um, uh, some of the limitations. Uh, for example, self-report measures are often used. And if you look at the central behaviour literature, often you'll find that um, measures such as television viewing will be independently associated with childhood obesity measures, uh, whereas accelerometry estimated central behaviour um, often tends not to be independently associated with measures of childhood obesity. And one of the um, key motivations that inspired us to use quantile regression is a lot of studies uh, tend to model the mean BMI um, and when you're focusing on obesity, the, the mean BMI is not necessarily that important. It's really the upper end of the uh, BMI distribution um, that we're interested in. And uh, quantile regression is a, is a method that can um, overcome this limitation. So just to speak a bit more about quantile regression, as I said, it's a statistical method that it allows you to extend your analysis beyond the, the mean of a phenotype. And uh, you can focus in on the tails. So in the context of childhood obesity, you may be interested in the 85th, 90th, 95th percentile, and you can um, not just limit your associations to the mean. And you can then test how predictors such as MVP and said behavior affect the shape of uh, the BMI or the circumference distribution. And uh, we were motivated to uh, apply and analyze uh, data from the ICAT dataset uh, because when the uh, ICAT dataset became publicly available, we had just published two papers using the quantile regression method showing that time spent in MVPA was associated with uh, lower BMI, and that association was stronger at the upper end of the distribution. And likewise, we had uh, shown that time spent in accelerometry estimated center behavior was independently associated with higher BMI, with that association being stronger at the upper end of the distribution. So ICAD offered us the opportunity to replicate our findings in a, a larger data set and in a more diverse data set. And furthermore, ICAD had um, greater uh, obesity uh, phenotype measures. So we previously, we had just focused on BMI. And in ICAD, we could extend that and also include the circumference as a measure of abdominal obesity. So the aims of our study were twofold. Uh, A1 was to determine if time spent in NDPA was independently associated with BMI and Waste circumference z score frequency distributions, and A2 uh, was likewise but for um, sedentary behavior. So, the data from ICAD that we analyzed um, it was all cross sectional data, and uh, we were only interested in um, children, so we uh, included the preschool children, so we had a data set comprised of 6 to 18 year old children um, that had complete accelerometry, anthropometric, and covariate data. And this left us with an analytical sample of a little over 11,000 children. So the uh, primary outcomes uh, were BMI and weight circumference z-scores, and our main predictors were accelerometry estimated MVP and sedentary behavior. Uh, to define MVP, we applied the Evenson cut point, and to define accelerometry estimated total sedentary behavior, we used the 100 pound per minute uh, cut point. And we also included uh, self-reported television viewing as a, a, a as a proxy measure of sedentary behavior, it's um, the single most common sedentary behavior that children typically engage in. So we're also interested in testing for associations with uh, TV viewing above and beyond and accelerometry estimated sedentary behavior. So for the quantile regression analysis, um, again, you know, we're looking beyond the mean analysis here, so we can focus on the lower end of the distribution, so the fifth, tenth, fifteenth percentile, and also at the upper end of the distribution, so the 85th, 90th, 95th. And in model 1A and 1B, 1A um, is the model with MVPA just in the model, adjusted for age, sex, race, and household income. And model 1B is likewise for accelerometry estimated sedentary behavior, adjusted for age, sex, race, and household income. And in model 2, we combined both um, MVPA and sedentary behavior into the same model to test for independent effects. And for the TV analysis, we adjusted for the same variance, but we also included MVPA and total sedentary behavior into the model at the same time. Uh, so these are the descriptive statistics. Um, you will see that approximately half the sample uh, comprised of boys, half comprised of girls. Um, the average age was around 12 years of age. 
Uh, we can see that the boys engaged in about 22 minutes, um, minutes per day more in NPA than the girls, and approximately 6% of our sample were classified as, uh, as obese um, based on the International Obesity Task Force definition. And uh, the majority of our sample was white. And so these are the findings uh, for MBPA. Um, the graph on the top, um, uh, so the graph on the top is um, for BMI z-score, the graph on the bottom is for waist circumference z-score. And on the y-axis are the beta coefficients, and on the x-axis um, represents the percentiles. And the horizontal red line um, represents the beta coefficient for a linear regression model, so this models the mean BMI or the mean waist circumference z-score. And the black uh, line uh, trending downwards are the quantile regression coefficients. So you can see here that at the lower end of the distribution, um, Compared to the linear regression model, um, the linear regression model is overestimating the strength of the association between MVP and lower BMI z-score, whereas at the upper end of the distribution, the linear regression model would be underestimating the strength of the association between MVP and uh, BMI z-score. Um, so by using quantile regression, we are picking out um, some richer information, information and uh, identifying these stronger associations in the uh, core segment of the population uh, that is very important in terms of childhood obesity. And uh, when we move along to model two, where we include sense behavior in the model, the MVP association remain unchanged. So MVP is highly uh, and very strongly associated with lower BMI and weight circumference score um, in the iCAT data set. And moving on to total sense behavior estimated by accelerometry, um, again, on the y axis we have the beta coefficients, and on the x axis we have the uh, percentiles and the red line again representing the linear regression model modeling the mean and uh, for total sedentary behavior we find a positive association so more time spent in sedentary behavior associated with a higher BMI z-score or a higher waist circumference z-score and again we pick out the stronger effect at the upper end of the distribution so these are the obese kids in the population so really speaking to the fact that sedentary behavior is um, strongly associated with childhood obesity However, when we introduce MVP into the model, this association uh, completely disappears so goes towards the null. And this is true even at the upper end of the distribution where we previously, previously observed um, the, the strongest effect. But when we look at uh, television viewing, um, we see some uh, interesting findings. So the top row represents the BMI and Z-score percentiles, and the bottom row represents the waist circumference uh, Z-score percentiles. And uh, the reference group here is less than one hour of television viewing per day. And the graph uh, further to the right um, represents one to two hours per day of TV viewing, uh, followed by two to three hours, and then four, um, greater than four hours of TV viewing per day. And we see a nice dose response that the more TV viewing engaged in is associated with higher BMI Z score and higher waist circumference Z score. And uh, what's interesting here is we have uh, controlled for age, sex, race, high school income, and MVP and total sedentary behavior. So the TV effect uh, remains even after you um, control for overall sedentary behavior, which is uh, quite interesting, I think. Uh, so some of the limitations. Um, so these are cross-sectional data, so also we don't know the, the direction of the association. Um, we included uh, data sets from Europe or North America, so we don't know if these observations apply to children from Asia, Africa, or South America. Um, we use BMI and waist circumference. Uh, these are anthropometric measures, so it'd be uh, good to replicate um, our findings using uh, more robust phenotypes for obesity. And uh, we have the problem of residual confinement, so we're unable to adjust for diet, take sleep, and other potential confiders. But in conclusion, uh, MVK was associated with lower BMI and waist circumference Z scores. Uh, likewise, TV was associated with higher BMI and waist circumference Z scores. Um, Accelerometry estimated total sedentary was associated with higher BMI and weight circumference, but these associ associations were not independent of time spent in MVPA. And interestingly, the MVP and TV associations were strongest at the upper um, percentiles of the z-score distributions. And um, how I interpret this is if we were to increase um, MVP and lower TV, we could shift the population distribution, especially at the upper end of the distribution, to lower values, thereby lowering the prevalence of childhood obesity. Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for Jonathan? No? 
want to take this? Yes. Uh, oh, hi, yeah. Anthony, Lavity, Imperial. So that's 6% of kids being obese. Uh, I might be wrong, but that's a bit lower than I would expect. Is that a sort of healthy responder effect, or is the data historical? Uh, it could be. So uh, to, to be included in the study, they had to have complete data. So it could be an effect of um, the kids that uh, wore these arometers and qualified. They could uh, be healthier and have a lower weight. So it just could be an artifact. Uh, but yeah, it'd be good to replicate in a population that is more representative of our current obesity levels. Um, so um, our final speaker is uh, another Anna, Anna Goodman. Um, who will be talking about daylight saving as a potential public health intervention. Thank you. Hi everyone. Can I start with a question? Who here lives somewhere which has daylight saving, so they change the clocks twice a year? I think, I think that might be everyone, or almost everyone. So you, you know what this is about. This is about the idea that um, in the summertime it gets light at 4am or 5am, times when people are asleep. And we already use daylight saving to shift those hours of daylight to the evening, so 7 p.m., 8 p.m., times when people are awake, so they get more waking daylight. And this is about the potential of kind of going one step further with that, having kind of you know, even you know, larger amounts of daylight saving, and it's kind of potential as a public health intervention. So this is um, something which I think is, let's say, it's, you know, it's niche within the kind of context of this one part, but it's something which various countries debate recurrently. So for example, in the UK in 2010, this happened many times over previous decades, but most recently in 2010, there was a debate about whether we should increase daylight saving by an extra hour. So instead of being Greenwich Mean Time in the winter, and um, one hour ahead in the summer, we'd be one hour ahead in the winter, and two hours ahead in the summer. And the idea was that for both adults and children, this would give them more waking time in the evening, and you can see the civil society campaign around this showed all these nice pictures of people playing outside and being active with all their extra daylight. But there wasn't any evidence that they were able to cite in support of this. It was just a kind of common sense argument. Similarly, as another example of somewhere that has recurrently kind of talked about daylight saving, Australia has had several referendums on this in some states. And even, which I think is kind of brilliant, there was this single issue political party called Daylight Saving for South East Queensland, which was founded specifically to campaign on this in the local the, the kind of state elections in 2008. So this is something which kind of currently comes up, with this idea that it would make people more active and make children more active is often part of the argument. And using ICAD, um, my colleagues at Bristol and I try to see if there's, you know, what evidence is there that extra daylight would boost children's activity. So in terms of our methods, of the 20 ICAD studies, we um, only looked at children of school age, and also there was one study which didn't have um, data on the, the date of collection, so that left 15 studies of the total. And then after taking out a few, a few studies with missing data, that left about 23,000 children with 160,000 days of measurement. The main outcome um, was average activity counts per minute, but everything I show you is very similar if you use percent time in moderate or vigorous physical activity. And the main exposure measure was time of sunset, so what time is at the, the sunset on each day of measurement. As covariates, um, these are age, sex, weight status, but also importantly weather. This has always been one of the big uncertainties. If you can see seasonal variations in activity, but people always say, and plus, you know, reasonably enough, well, it might just be because it's cold or it's wet in winter. You know, you don't, as easy you know, it's the dark. So this is one thing we wanted to look at. So we adjusted for weather. Um, this is the unit's analysis, because weather varies by day. And then also, interestingly, um, for me particularly, trying to use this natural experiment that happens, as in most of your countries when the clocks change, that over the course of a week, daylight does shift by an hour. So if you follow the same child either side of that, you can see what happens to that child either side. So to start with looking at um, day length and total activity across the day. So along the x-axis, you have hour of sun sunset. So um, on this side, when it's setting before 5 p.m., so it's kind of winter months, up to um, setting at 9 o'clock or later in the summer and in, in between. You can see that total activity across the day is on average higher um, when you know, the later sunset is. And that this gets weaker, unsurprisingly, but still remains quite a clear dose-response effect after you adjust for weather. So there does seem to be some evidence that you know, 
children are more active on um, days of later sunset. In terms of starting to think about, is this causal? One nice thing about accelerometer data, of course, is you can look at the pattern across the day. So for weekdays on this side, weekends on that side, then what you can see is that in the morning, there's not very much difference between these days with from the black line when the sunset's earliest to the red line when it's latest. But it's in the afternoon and early evening when you see the lines spreading out, which corresponds to when daylight, you know, weather is colder across the day in winter across the whole day, but it's in the afternoon and evening when daylight kicks in. And if you look closely, you can see that the line declines most steeply, corresponding with the hour when sunset's happening. So this is some evidence of a causal effect. Also nicely in this natural experiment, the same child followed, for example, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday before the clocks changed, and Monday, Tuesday, the week after. You can see that, again, there's not much evidence of any difference in the morning, but in the afternoon there is um, evidence that the children are more active on the days where it's the lighter side of the clocks changing. And to put this kind of in co context, this is about a 5% increase in their total daily activity for this extra hour of daylight, and that's kind of consistent across the different ways of measuring it. So, summarising so far, um, there is evidence that um, an extra hour of daylight is associated with some increase in total physical activity. And also, I think this, um, for the first time, provides some, to me, quite convincing evidence that this is causal. You see the effect in the afternoon, in the early evening, and you see it across the changing of the clocks. Also, although I, I'm not going to show you the data for this, but when we looked, this effect was equitable across lots of different groups. So, um, children of different ages, boys and girls, um, obese and overweight as well as normal weight children, and children of different levels of mother's education, all of them were more active um, on days with more daylight. So there seems to be an equitable intervention, which is important. But, and this is the last um, results slide I'll show, there was evidence of heterogeneity by setting. So in the mainland European and English samples, and to slightly lesser extent the Australian sample, there was evidence that having um, uh, longer daylight was associated on that side of the graph with an increase in physical activity. Not really any evidence of it in the two US samples or in the, the samples from other places, Madeira and um, Brazil. So there did seem to be heterogeneity by place. We only saw evidence of this in the mainland European, UK and Australian samples. So to have some um, kind of my thoughts on this, firstly in terms of this um, substantive findings, I think a 5% change is, is clearly small. Um, in absolute terms, but I think it's not trivial. Even our, you know, our, our really good individual interventions often do well to get kind of 10%, 15% increase in total activity. So compared to the alternatives, it's not trivial. And also, really importantly, this is an average across all children. All children are exposed to an extra hour of daylight. So in terms of that issue of reach, this is something which can apply across the whole population. So even 5% of the population level, I think, is not trivial. And therefore, I think this would be a step in the right direction in terms of trying to increase children's activity. And then also in terms of just highlighting some of the nice things about iPad, then, you know, firstly, this sort of these small effects, 5%, which are not trivial but are small, you know, without large statistical power and really precise objective measures, you'd struggle to find that it would, it would disappear as noise. Also this idea that um, having this really large data set, it doesn't just let you have small confidence intervals, but also, for example, this natural experiment question. There, because it's such a big data set, there are enough children either side of the clock change to let you do that, which is, I think, quite a powerful um, analysis, and it? it kind of shows where a large sample can unlock new sets of questions as well. And then also this nice um, kind of cross-country, multi-country setting means you can then start to pick some of this variation across place as well. So thank you um, for me to all of you for listening, uh, for listening and happy to take any questions. So this is a really good question. So it's a question about sleep. So maybe we're getting more activity but worse sleep with the extra um, daylight. This is um, not something we could look at wonderfully in iCAD. It doesn't measure um, wake time and um, sleep time very well. What you do have though is wear time, which often 
you know, it's what children were instructed to do, and um, you know, they do usually seem to have done this, you know, you put it on when you get up and you take it off when you go to bed. And that didn't vary across the season. So it wasn't, although it's not exactly the same as sleep, there wasn't any evidence that children were up for longer, which is at least reassuring. Yes, um, thanks. This is about that variation across the different countries. Um, we, so as a post hoc analysis, because I, I only thought to think about this once we saw the variation, but temperature is the, um, what we think might be happening with that. So we, we only, it's post hoc, but we only did one post hoc thing, so maybe that balances out a bit. And certainly the places, so Brazil, um, Madeira, and also in the US, lots of them were kind of quite southern US states, are places that are quite hot. So, so possibly, um, and it seems to me somewhat plausible, it might be that extra daylight, if it's really hot outside, you still stay inside. So it might be, you could imagine this to be something that would be most effective in kind of temperate places, where it's not too hot to be outside if it's light. That, that's my, my guess. Great, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll now move on to yeah. you. Stuart. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, to Stuart Biddle, who will um, give us our thoughts, his thoughts, not our thoughts, um, on the iPad database and lead our discussion. Thank, thanks, Esther. Uh, hi, everyone. So um, I'm here as the non-iCAD expert, <coughs> which, uh, as I say in many of these sessions when I'm asked to be the discussant, it's great, because I can say what the hell I like, <laughs> with no data to back it up. Um, but so first of all, thanks very much. It's a fantastic uh, set of papers. And uh, here are my random, or maybe not so random, thoughts. The random thoughts have come into my head in the last hour, and the not so random are the ones I thought about beforehand. And the two are completely uncorrelated. Um, so, you know, clearly this is a fantastic data set, and I'm not, I'm not an accelerometer expert, but I've worked with others, of course, in projects where accelerometers have been used. And uh, a couple of things uh, that strike me. First of all, the applications perhaps are somewhat broader than we initially think. And I think we've heard that today. Typically, we think of accelerometers being as just as a simple outcome measure or maybe in some kind of surveillance study. But we've heard about you know, potential natural experiments, obviously health outcomes, uh, and, then, uh, and then around issues of cultural diversity uh, because of you know, relatively standardized protocols, pooling of data in this case clearly is one of the strengths of, of a very large study like this. Um, hinted at uh, Anna, Anna too, um, was the, you know, the variations that you might get. Um, actually, I think it was from uh, Lauren as well. Uh, the variations you might get across countries in, um, in the values, and that, that interests me. And this is somebody this is me talking, who might be showing some ignorance here, but I'm wondering whether we couldn't explain those variations um, by looking at the, the what, what accelerometers actually do measure and how they measure. Are we missing something there? I don't, I don't believe that Norwegians are that much more active than British or anybody else, and yet we seem, seem to be getting some quite big variations there. So that, that kind of intrigued me, you know, are we picking up the right things here? And of course, one of the key issues, and this is something I've always thought about as more as a behavioral scientist, is what, what are these behaviors? You know, what are the moderate to vigorous physical activity behaviors that people are engaging in? And so the, the obvious conclusion that now we've got these objective measures, we can dismiss any kind of self-report, well, of course, we've heard in these presentations that may not always be such a good thing. So the, 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 in, inter, uh, um, the interrelationship between, say, self-reported TV and then objectively measured sedentary time, you know, it's quite an important issue to address. So we can now do both of those things. And uh, so I'm thinking this huge variation between studies or between <coughs> countries, I should, I should say, uh, I'd like to tease that one out a bit more. Um, the other issue that comes out to me with this kind of data and the presentations we've had today, because this is on children, I've always wondered whether we're trying to find things that just don't exist, such as uh, kids are essentially healthy. 
Now, of course, we can argue about that, well, obesity and, and da di da but all these, you know, the big ICAD study um, that Ulf um, led, and, and Lauren was involved in the Lancet, or was it JAMA? JAMA. Um, you know, it didn't show much of a relationship between uh, total sedentary time and cardiometabolic outcomes. Are we expecting anything more than that in children? And so when you then, you then come across Jonathan's analysis where actually he's saying, well, let's look at this across categories of health and let's look at people who are actually more obese and see what the effects are there. That might be a very interesting way of doing it. Maybe it's only possible when you've got these large data sets. So it's always been something when I was you know, quite heavily involved in, in childhood studies. You know, what do we expect? If you had a picture of Chris Ridder up there, Chris said to me many years ago when we were first doing the UK guidelines on um, children's physical activity in the 1990s, uh, he did a fantastic chapter <clears throat> in, in, the, in the book we produced that said, well actually, a lot of physical activity for children doesn't show large effects on health outcomes. Of course, we, we tend to reject that, don't we? We feel rather, rather antagonistic towards that conclusion. But if a lot of kids are essentially healthy, notwithstanding some variations, what are we expecting to get? Uh, particularly from relatively uh, low potent behaviors, some of which might be some sedentary behaviors. So maybe these large data sets can start to tease that out, and maybe we need to do what Jonathan has done, which is to say, make sure we can test this out against different levels of health outcomes. I really like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that, that, that's a, that was a key issue for me, is, is this health uh, issue. So Anna, Anna, Anna Temperio's uh, study on cardiometabolic outcomes and TV viewing and so on, you know, how much would we expect from that, we can argue at both sides. TV is a big behavior, um, but you know the other thing then is, well, what about the coexisting behaviors? What else is going on? And of course, accelerometry doesn't do that, uh, so we have to to ask you know, a number of um, you know related questions alongside it. So I'd like to hope that we can get a big data set like this. I'm sure there exist these co-behaviors, and let let's try and um, let's try and tease that tease that out. Um, so we had a natural experiment uh, bit in the last paper from Anna Goodman, uh, absolutely fantastic, I, I love all that. Um, but then again, you're teasing out underneath that headline figure that daylight saving seems to make a difference. It only made a difference in some countries. And um, I wasn't aware, uh, Anna, actually, that it might be temperature related. Actually, I'm wondering whether it's humidity related. Um, you know, I've, I've interacted with a lot of people in, in Singapore and they, they tell me it's the humidity rather than the heat per se, I don't know, but, but it's, it's a really interesting uh, issue. So I, I guess one of my take home messages from all of this is what a fantastic data set this is. It's a unique resource. I guess it's being developed even further. Um, we need to take it into new countries, of course, and new contexts. And it's that context that I'd really like to see uh, developed. And so when we're testing Brazil versus, you know, Africa, com African countries versus whatever, we can have that data underneath it that says, right, this might explain these uh, well-measured differences between uh, groups of children in these different countries. Um, so, so that would be definitely a, a take-home message uh, for me. Okay, so I think that's, those are probably some of the issues that I'll, I'll, I'll raise for now and uh, maybe allow a bit more discussion and questions from, from the floor. So, shall I, Chair, uh, shall I get some questions in, right? So, uh, any questions? <laughs> okay, yeah, let's get the speakers up and we could have some general ICAD questions or we can have, yeah, let's, let's try and keep it at a more general level if we can. Okay, let's, let's kick off. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> Well, let me ask you a question to the panel. Where's it? Okay, in a minute. Where are we going to go with this? Where, where's iPad going to go? What are we going to be? What are we going to be seeing in five years' time? <laughs> well, you're going to keep keep the secrets to yourself. No, no, no. So I'm going to be 
So at the moment, um, we're working on um, collecting further data from the, the studies that are um, currently in ICAD. So that is, uh, as Lauren explained, it's adding longitudinal data on studies that collected further waves um, of data collection. But we're also very much focusing on expanding exactly what you're talking about, um, the, the information about the determinants of the behaviour. So we, we, we are collecting further information about behavioural determinants, psychological determinants, social determinants, environmental determinants, um, which is a, a great idea, um, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, with the challenge that we have to harmonise this data across all of these different studies. So there are 21 studies, they've probably all collected these measures in a, in a slightly different way. And so the challenge is to create harmonised uh, measures out of that. And that is the challenge we'll be tackling over the next year or so. We're hoping that this new longitudinal version of ICAP will be available in the next year with some of this harmonised data. Um, and then we'll continue working on harmonising the data. Um, so that would be ICAT 2.1, 2.0, and then going further to ICAT 2.1 is what Lauren was talking about, is we're currently in the process of identifying further studies that can contribute to ICAT, um, but also looking at ways that we can make ICAT more dynamic to give, like um, Anna was referring to, at the moment um, ICAT's quite static, like her TV viewing measure that's only available in the four categories. We're looking at ways of making ICAT more dynamic so you can decide for yourself how to harmonize that data, um, but also that we have a process of continuously adding further studies that would like to contribute their data to ICAT. And that doesn't put the onus completely on us. And that's a, a very much a, a five-year plan to uh, enable us to do that. That's great. That's really helpful. Uh, Gentlemen. Uh, may I start with a very provocative comment? <laughs> you, you, use, the, use the microphone, please. Thanks. Yeah. So my comments are usually provocative. This is a special <laughs> provocative one. So um, I question, not, not only I, me and Adrian Bowman, question the objectivity of, of accelerometry. We question it in our recent BGSM paper. Uh, so, uh, and is, you know, we, we really believe it's a, a subjective method, although we want, uh, like to call it objective measure. Uh, and we believe it's subjective because uh, participants can influence uh, measures and estimates, and they really influence the measures and estimates. Uh, Tempering the data, especially in children, then influencing non varying time that also includes the, the results and stuff like that, and non varying in special occasions like during physical activities and stuff. And the, uh, the most importantly, uh, the, the main thing, the main uh, criticism of uh, self reports was that they are uh, influenced by social desirability. But in, in the, the most important paper about social desirability of uh, questionnaires, uh, the, the, the strongest correlation uh, between the social desirability and physical activity data was observed for accelerometer data. So, yeah, just, just an observation, and, but it's a, it's a uh, fantastic database and, and a set of fantastic studies. Okay, well, that's a great, that, that, that's great. Uh, I, I feel an Ismin Par debate coming on uh, for, for next year. Uh, no, great, let's have some responses then about. Uh, yeah, and I agree with a lot of what you've said, and I don't think any one measure is perfect. So, um, so, so report. I think they should be used in conjunction. It is something that we we were looking at when we were originally pooling data. Um, nutrition was the other one. Um, Self-report measures of diet and, and also self-report measures um, of physical activity. It was very hard to get harmonised measures across studies. Um, we got active commuting a few indicators, um, but I would say that we have thirty thousand accelerometer variables, probably in the ICAD data set at least. Um, there's a lot of potential to look across different times of day, looking for reactivity potentially. So we can actually perhaps distill some of the limitations you talk about better using ICAD, and that can maybe bring us forward, and maybe help us provide recommendations of pairing up of different measures of activity so we get a better overall picture of physical activity and sedentary behavior in children. What what's the what, what are your what are your thoughts across the panel here on on reactivity? We all know that um, something like a you know a Fitbit or a pedometer where you can instantly see your score, 
it is going to be more reactive, whereas a, 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 an actigraph is a black box. So, what, yeah, do, you, what, do, you, what do you think? I mean, talking about ICA, there were many of the studies that used delayed initialization. So, we actually, the first day one in the data set was actually not when they first wore the monitor. Um, so, maybe there's a little bit of the washing out of the immediate reactivity, especially in young children. Um, I also strongly believe that if the reactivity is that potent, then why don't we just give everyone accelerometers and that could be our intervention to get everyone more active. So. Yeah. Anybody else now? Yeah. I'm actually presenting a poster on that next week at ICANN Fair. Right. So in our studies on children in Melbourne and CPAM, we typically drop the first day of data collection because of this reactivity issue. So when we explore it in a little bit more detail, um, this activity on that day is a tiny little bit higher, adjusted for wear time, because obviously the wear time might be a bit shorter on that day. Um, but overall, once it's the average of like, minutes per day, it makes very little difference. So uh, but you lose cases, potentially, depending on your criteria for how many days of data you can include by excluding that day. So. That's great. Good. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah. Because it is um, slightly different time, but I'm not really an accelerometer expert. So, like I said, imagine that it's, it's not perfect, so whether you call it subjective or subjective is maybe in some ways philosophical. I find it hard to believe it's not better than self-report for these some sorts of things. So the patterning across the day, you find it very, you know, be high participant burden to get anything like that. And I'd also like to be surprised if it's not, if you'd easily be able to detect something like a 5% change before and after with self-report. I mean, so even if it's not perfect, my sense is it would have more precision. I mean, I haven't done the analysis early self-report, but I'd be surprised if it doesn't have more precision in measuring physical activity than some of the self-report ones, as well as having less participant burden. Actually, I wanted to pick up on one of those in my discussion, and then with my scribble notes, I, I, I missed it out. The, yeah, the issue of, uh, of temporality, for example, mm -hmm. across the day, I think is really important. And uh, so in yours, Anna, you know, you, you, you could have found a, a uh, so-called effect for daylight savings, and yet all the physical activity might come in the middle of the day, which would have made no no sense. But in fact, it was at the end. It was at the time when you would expect it to occur, and, and that, that's what accelerometer data will give you. So, I think this notion of so it comes back to my issue about context. Let's understand the context of physical activities, and therefore we need to understand how they're uh, how they're spread across the day. Same with sedentary behaviour, of course. So. Um, uh, that, that's an important point, so thank, thanks for raising that. Okay, great, nice discussion. We've got one more, another one? Anybody want to raise an issue? Yeah, here we go, at the back, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a more general question about the pooling of data um, and pushing that forward in the field, but it's kind of two questions. Is there, are there some key points from uh, the ICAN study that, that your experiences would, say, facilitate pooling other data? Um, both from the perspective of you as people who pull the data and also people generating the data in the first place. Um, should they have an eye on pooling the data in the future so that um, we can get more sort of pooled data that maybe becomes more of the norm rather than the exception? Yeah, yeah I'll just talk about the accelerometer today too. I think with the new versions of, of accelerometers and we're getting the more Hertz data, um, it's obviously good to have good deployment techniques um, so that the data is collected, but it's actually less of a concern now because, for example, epoch length is not a matter. We can reintegrate the Hertz data up to whatever epoch we like. So I actually see with the accelerometer and with pattern recognition and the way that accelerometry is moving forward, that potentially um, prescribing a protocol for collecting of objective monitoring is probably less of a concern than it was perhaps 10 years ago. Um, the phenotypic data is, is another kettle of fish, and I'll let Esther talk about that. <laughs> um, in terms of the phenotypic data, what we're talking about here in ICAD is retrospective data harmonization. Um, there are more and more examples across the world where um, prospective data harmonization is being conducted, with a prime example being the Iscoli study, where they've actually they had a core set of determinant measures that was used across all of the countries but they actually allowed the countries to have some cultural variability and add their own uh, measures to it. Um, I think we, we need to uh, move forward with both. And I think at the moment, 
Uh, it would be a shame to throw away all of this data that is really rich and will allow us to study cultural vari variability and what are the cross-cultural differences and similarities in determinants of physical activity just because they didn't use the same measure. I think we do need to be very careful in harmonising data and actually check what our harmonisation is doing and whether it's, it's still showing similar associations with a harmonised variable as opposed to the original variable. So I think it's a very challenging process, um, but I think it is one way of moving forward. And I think we need to do both and become better at both. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How, yeah, anybody else? How satisfied are we at the moment? Oh, there's a question. No, go for it, yeah, go for it. I'm only filling time. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that Lauren just mentioned about the pattern recognition with accelerometers because I know that our ability to um, recognise behaviours from objective data and accelerometers is, um, is progressing and I guess I was just asking if there have been any discussions or plans to do that with the ICAD data and I, I, I don't know a lot about it but I think um, that you need triaxial accelerometer data to get good results. And so I guess I was just wondering what proportion of the ICAD data might be, um, you might be able to do that with. Yeah, I mean, Catherine, that's a really good question. And it's what we've been grappling with for, for probably the last two years, talking about what's happening now with the next pooling of data and what will happen in the future. Um, in reality, we probably will end up using one axis probably um, for the first pooling, even if they've used triaxial. Um, there's also a lot of other information that's coming out. Um, we've got LUX, we've got inclinometer data. We've always got that information, and I think probably a motto of ICAD is we don't walk before we can run. So we will probably start off with pooling what we know, um, and then we've always got that to, to, to move ahead. But we've got lots of other issues that we'll, we'll have to come across. We've got risk-worn versus waste-worn uh, monitors. We've got these different versions of monitors being used. The Genie Active is gaining a lot of momentum in the literature. So um, harmonizing of phenotypic data is a problem, but it's going to be soon harmonization across more than just an actograph monitor, so yeah, it's something for the future for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm really sorry because I missed the first little bit of the session, so you have <laughs> spoken about it. Um, but in terms of the data that is available, is it all means uh, for a day, or do you have like to? exact values for each day across studies for individuals because I think that would be a really interesting thing to explore that I think we're missing sometimes we're just averaging one value across the week and not looking at patterns during the week, patterns during the day um, and in such a huge sample size you have the power to do that and control for a whole bunch of different variables that I think would be really interesting to look at and what affects that variability and how that variability as much as you know the breaks in sedentary behavior, the lengths of sedentary behavior and all that could influence on health behaviors or health outcomes and all that. Yeah, one thing we're not lacking is accelerometer variables in ICAD. So <laughs> we've got an awful lot, so anyone that wants to use them, please do. Um, we have hour by hour plots, we have day by week, we also have um, total values, so that would be the average across seven days, but also across weekend, across week days, with the potential to look at breaks in sedentary time. Um, we did some windows of time, um, so we've got like a school day, which uh, you could calculate by adding the hour to hour, but if you go across half an hour, then this enables you to go across half an hour slots. We've got an awful lot of, um, of data. It's just actually getting enough people and hands on deck to actually analyze it. So anyone that wants to use it, go to the uh, ICAD website on the MRC webpage and, and, and put in a proposal. It's actually free, which we should have mentioned. It's one, probably one of the only data access um, data sets that is free, um, and we have quite a quick turnaround. So please do use the data, because as Sylvia said, there's lots of questions to be addressed. I presume all the, day, all the data is, is from waste on the Yes, yeah. I yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, one more question. It's not so promoting. <laughs> <laughs> How do your, your countries and, and different studies that you pulled uh, compare in, in uh, standardized protocols of data collection? And do they collect, particularly, I'm interested in, do, do they collect data using the 
same type and generation of accelerometers. <laughs> Um, so when um, ICAD was originally pulled, that was in 2008, so at that point I think the GT3X actigraph had just been introduced. So the majority is either GT1N monitors or the old white CSA 7164 monitors. Um, to my knowledge, there's no sort of monitor adjustment that has happened. So they have been treated as one type of monitor. We know there's some variability between them. However, we also know that there's inter-monitor variability even within the same um, monitor type. So that's something we always have to deal with. In terms of the uh, measurement protocols, I think they're broadly similar, but obviously every, every researcher has their own preferences on how to deal with the, the proto uh, how to deal with accelerometer data collection. I think the advantage here is that we've, it's, it's the processing end but that is probably most influential in terms of the actual results that you get and that's what we've been able to harmonise. So just one other comment, we do have serial numbers as well so we, you can look at the difference between um, monitors within a study and also between studies as well. Has, that, has anybody done that? Is there any significant issue there? We did some exploratory work and there wasn't. It seems like potentially we did have 71256, I think, monitor, but only a couple of them. From not our work, but other work, it seems like the biggest difference between the versions of the monitor is probably in the sedentary range, in those low counts. Um, but in the moderate to vigorous, it doesn't seem in the light category, there seems to be very little difference. Well, that was one of the questions. I'm, <coughs> I was interested in anybody on the panel, you know, how satisfied are we with measures of sedentary behaviour? We're thinking, yeah, it's okay. We know it doesn't measure actual sitting time, but it is what it is. Um, any comments? Um, I think it's uh, it's pretty good. I think that it gets at um, overall sound behaviors that maybe you can't recall um, using a sound report measure. It's quite difficult to because you sit a lot during the day, so it's quite difficult to recall. But um, I think I was in a session this morning. Um, we were discussing standing versus sitting. So are you getting health benefits by standing? And um, I think that's where the accelerometer is really poor. Um, yeah. You're probably getting classified as being said um, during a large proportion of your standing time. Okay. So, um, I think just to add to that, obviously ICAD is a great resource, but it does have its limitations as well. Um, and one of the limitations is that the early, earlier monitors, in terms of battery use, you always have to use a 60 second epoch in order to measure for uh, a week. And so in order to harmonize the data, that's what um, ICAD has, has needed to do um, with all of the later cohorts as well that may have actually collected data in five second epochs. And we know that that reduces the amount of time spent in MVPA and um, sedentary and sort of um, increases the amount of light because it sort of averages over the minute. So that is one of the limitations of the, the current ICAD database. And a final thought for me, and this again might be shown by ignorance, what are your views on uh, wrist-worn versus uh, uh, waist-worn, and what would happen if uh, a big study came in and wanted to join ICAD and it's all wrist-worn, what are the issues that you might have to get to grips with?